The Switch. The Switch is a podcast about ideas and experiences that change our minds. I'm your host, Chase Harris, joined as always by my co-host, Alex Berner. The Switch is a podcast that is produced by our audio company, Mojo Filter Media. We are hosted by the 52 Living Ideas meetup group. That's where a bulk of our audience, uh, live audience, comes from. And we are, of course, a Patreon-funded podcast. And even though we would still be doing this without your support on Patreon, the generous contributions of our patrons definitely allow us to do more interviews, uh, more content more often, different guests, better and better quality. It lets us spend some time on things like prepping for these episodes, uh, spending time on the exercises, making sure that everything is awesome, and getting that content out there, hosting the content, hosting the podcast, putting out the YouTube videos, everything like that. So if you do find this valuable, please head on over to patreon.com slash switch underscore podcast. That's all I'll say about that. Without further ado, here's week two, Outwitting the Devil. Before we get into our first principle in our set of weekly principles from Outwitting the Devil, I gave everyone an exercise for last week. And the exercise was essentially to get a, uh, a full picture of the book, but in as much detail as you can. Essentially, look at the full picture and increase your resolution to whatever degree you've got time to do that. So uh, if anybody who completed that, first of all, actually, anybody who completed that exercise, go ahead and just type in the chat, I did it. <clears throat> and I'd like to line up a couple of volunteers to answer the question, what did you get from it? What did you get from reading the book? What did you get from increasing your resolution on understanding the book? Uh, We'll take two, three, four people. And while you are lining yourselves up in the chat or simply letting me know that you did it in the chat, uh, I'm going to have Alex answer the question because he finished the book this week. So Alex, Start us off. What did you get from it? What were your your highlights? And ideally, call it like two to five minutes on highlights. So I just finished the book today and um, I find it as a really unique document. Um, I think specifically the premise and the method um, of the writing is really what stands out to me. Specifically, um, kind of how things are divided into binaries. So we have the good and the bad thing to do because we have the devil telling us, you know, everything from his perspective. So it's easy to categorize good or bad. And also that dichotomy between the interviewee and interviewer. And I think it just helps to create these pretty strict boundaries between what's good and what's bad, which I think in a lot of philosophies is not necessarily so, so, uh, strict. Um, I think it can be a powerful call to action, right? By creating a good guy and a bad guy or a good action or a bad action. So, you know, dividing people into drifters versus non-drifters and basically saying you don't want to be one of the non, one of the drifters. Um, So I think just that dichotomy that it shows is helpful for me. Um, and just kind of sorting through some of the uh, gray and stuff and actually taking action. Awesome. Did any of the specific principles, either the ones that that we outlined or some of the other, they give in the list a couple of uh, very clean lists of sort of either principles or uh, ways of being what a drifter looks like, what a non-drifter looks like. Did any of the principles stand out to you? Like what, what were your key takeaways about how to avoid being a drifter? Um, like I mentioned last week, I think in general, everything seemed intuitively sound to me. I think the biggest thing that struck me, because I feel like I would agree with it, when I'm would consider myself drifting or non-drifting would be the definiteness of purpose. And when I keep my eyes on that and keep my intentions centered around that, everything lines up 
And it is like a snowball effect as it's kind of described in the book. If you are becoming a drifter, if you don't have definiteness of purpose, it'll snowball into worse and worse and worse and, you know, vice versa. So yeah, I'd say that. And then lastly, did you do any other inspectional work using other sources? Things like, did you watch any recap videos, look at anybody else's notes, outlines, things like that? I'm just curious. No, I, I listened to the audio book and well, uh, what Reddit accompanying that as well. And, and it was interesting okay. also having a, it, it, it's interesting to see the impact different narrators can have on the text. You know, that's a little bit of a side, a side point, but the devil, whoever was narrating it was great and really gave everything a weight that I think was nice to listen to and not just read. Cool. All right. Thanks, Alex. Uh, next up, we're going to have Joe chime in. Joe, so how much of the book did you get a picture on and sort of what were your key takeaways? Um, some of my key, I got through the first five chapters, so I just got up to the point where they were starting to speak about truth, which actually would have been really interesting. So I got a little bit of a late start, uh, to reading it. So that's a little bit unfortunate, but there's a lot to take away even within that first five chapters is the, I thought the distinction between a creative, I mean, a, a, a drifter and a non-drifter was also something that kind of stuck out with me. It's very binary which I didn't necessarily see the world that way, especially coming out of the Great Depression when this book is actually being uh, uh, taking place. That was a very difficult period where we meet adversity and we just, you know, overcome it and we find ourselves through this adversity. I completely agree with that premise, but I don't necessarily think that it's as simple as just, you know, you adapt to the environment. Um, because some of those situations were so difficult um, that I think that, it, you know, it would be very challenging. And I understand that's the point of the book. Uh, and that's the difference between success and non-success. Um, but uh, I don't think it's as, as binary as it, to me, as it makes it out to be. Uh, the other thing that struck me is, too, is how success was defined as well um, in the sense of, who was successful, these captains of industry, these are the independent thinkers. And, you know, that to me is not necessarily what is a meaningful life uh, or an independent thinker. You know, an independent thinker can be in any walk of life. And I think that that's a really important uh, concept is that it's not necessarily the captains of industry that I've always had the highest regard for, it's the everyday individuals that, um, you know, have their own thoughts and are living their own authentic life. Uh, so I think that that's a much more meaningful way to portray what success is really all about. Um, you know, some of the other things were, you know, the idea that uh, there, there were a couple of other things that I'm trying to gather my thoughts very quickly. Um, the idea of I did, I really appreciated the fact of when the devil said, how, or he asked the devil, then how do you overcome, uh, you know, essentially being a drifter? And he said immediately help others. And uh, essentially. And so to me, I think that that is one of the guiding principles of the entire book that is really important is the idea of getting outside yourself. Uh, and that falls in line with uh, principle number four which I don't have written down in front of me, but essentially look at a service first um, was, and that was one of the primary principles that I had identified as something that's very important to me personally. Um, as far as outside sources go, you know, I found a lot of actual things that uh, really are that, that, um, oh, and one other thing that I can honestly say that stuck out is that, uh, it's a very creative indiv you know, individual that wrote this book and he valued creativity very high. And that's really important when you're talking about being independent. And that's kind of goes to the narrative of independence as well. Um, you know, and I think that that sometimes gets over a little bit overvalued in the book. 
Um, not that I don't value it personally. I value thinking differently and authentically more than anything else. But it's not at the expense of everybody else. You know, it's, it's not binary as, as much as I, you know, think it was made out to be. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, and again, I have, I did look into some of my own personal principles as well. Uh, and I matched them up. Uh, I don't know if you want me to go through some of them, but that would be, you know, this idea of how to handle desire was also a theme in the first five chapters anyway. Uh, and I see yeah. a lot of um, things that are related to stoicism actually that would answer a lot of these, uh, you know, or uh, these principles would be reinforced in stoicism. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I think the stoicism connection, that's one that I've identified as well, that at least for me in applying a lot of these principles has helped be a guide. I, I really like, I mean, the, the principles of stoicism speak to me quite a bit and going through outwitting the devil, I'm constantly thinking, okay, well, how would the, how would the Stoics, how would Epictetus right. interpret this advice? What do you think about the idea of indifference though? So, and then that, cause I didn't get that feeling that indifference existed into the, in, in this, in this, um, uh, in this, um, uh, in the first five chapters anyway. So I shouldn't be speaking too like authoritatively, um, but you know, the idea that, you know, um, there's one of my favorite sayings in the poems, if that I find that resonates with stoicism is if it, you can meet triumph and disaster and treat these two imposters the same, you know, it's almost as if Napoleon Hill saying triumph is the only, is the only good and disaster is a product of your inability or your conforming to the rest of society or to the devil himself. Um, and I found that to be a very difficult thing to accept, uh, you know, and I like the stoic principle of indifference yeah. in, in this particular case. So, um, you know, that was something that I actually, I use as principles in general, you know, to be lied about and not deal with lies, you know, and, you know, that's in, in, the, in the poem if, um, so there, there's a lot of there, there's a lot of the what, um, resonates with me in, in that regard. Uh, but, you know, the, there, there are multiple things that I've written down that I'm not going to go, I mean, I, I don't want to take up too much more time. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's an excellent book. I think it captures the, I mean, I, I know I've spoken, you know, some counter points to the author. Um, you know, especially when it comes to the idea of the either or, uh, but uh, the idea of independent thinking is absolute when it comes to being authentic. Yeah. And so I think that that's a really important point. If I had an overarching theme out of the first five chapters, it would be that. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, again, uh, I'll maybe have a little bit more next week, uh, but and I did take, uh, I did do the exercise um, as far as my values. And the way I check my values is the opposite has to be true. Like, so how do you know something's good in stoicism? That's how you come up with these, um, you know, these, these, you know, uh, cardinal virtues is that, you know, if you're, you know, wisdom is, you know, you don't want to be unwise. So that it means being wise is always good. So I kind of look at something like, you know, loving yourself as being a principle, but you don't want to hate yourself. So that would, the opposite would be hating yourself. So therefore loving yourself would be good because then it creates space for loving other people. These are some of the principles that I had written down just differently, but I think that they are captured in certain ways into the book. There's some other ones as, uh, as well as um, don't give up on creative you know, pursuits because creativity is fundamental to independent uh, thinking. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, I think that to not be creative um, is to maybe even allow your anger to creep in and things like that. So anyway, that's, that was maybe a little bit not as clear, but um, anyway, I'll, I'll leave it there. Thanks. And, and yeah, Joe, just to comment on what you said about um, kind of leaving out the gray, you know, or the, the, how you react to a situation. I, I agree with you that it's definitely left out, 
but there he does focus on a, accumulating wisdom later right. on in the book and and I do think that this is one of those kind of methodologies that allows for other things to be incorporated into it, you know, because I feel like a definiteness of purpose could be practicing stoicism, you know, it could be part of that or being a Buddhist, which integral to that is, you know, finding that neutrality and balance. So I think it's, it's like a structure that that could be incorporated into without necessarily negating it. Yeah, I, I mean, it's yeah. not it's not dogmatic, you know, it isn't dogmatic, but it just comes off that way when it says, well, who's successful? Who are the 2% that we can point to as not being, and that's where I got out of it as I, I was like, well, wait a minute, you know, there are good people, I mean, you know, non, you know, uh, people not being tempted by the devil. It's not, oh, you're, you're, you're working against the devil, therefore you're free or you're this huge successful mogul. Those are the individuals that are the ones that freed their minds. Well, no, there are plenty of people that freed their minds and that are living wonderful lives. That's the only difference. That, yeah, but I, I see what yeah. you're saying. I can, and I can definitely see where the accumulation of wisdom down the line is uh, coming in. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll, we'll get into that when we, we get into the, uh, the principle of decide definitely what you want from life. Right. And exactly. I saw that. Yeah. You know, when we get into that one, we'll talk about what does that actually mean to want something definitely from life? What should you want definitely from life? How do you decide? We'll ask, we'll go through all those questions. Um, all right. All right. Thanks. Cool. Sorry, guys. Thank you, Joe. Yeah. And uh, no, that was great. David. <clears throat> Yeah, so um, I also listened to the full audiobook this week. Um, really enjoyed it. I had mentioned last week that I was listening to Think and Grow Rich prior to becoming a part of this group here. And it was interesting to see like the overlap between the two. I haven't finished Think and Grow Rich yet, but there's definitely overlap there. And um, I actually did kind of like the black and whiteness of the 98% versus the 2% because what I related it to was just the basic concept of fear and faith. Like that's what it seemed to be for me is like the drifter when he was referring to them were people who acted from a place of fear. Um, whereas this 2% that he's referring to seem to be people who they listed out at the end, have definiteness of purpose, have definiteness of plan and are able to have time kind of take all of that with them. So it was cool to obviously absorb the book. I haven't looked into any other thoughts about it, which I do want to do and just see how that affects my own life and being able through the week to see, oh, that's just a fear that's popping into my head and understanding that if I follow that, that puts me in the direction of the drifter of that 98%. But if I can learn to train my mind to ignore that essentially and still follow that definite, definiteness of purpose, definiteness of plan, then ideally I can become part of that 2% and not drift anymore. So like I said, want to study up on it a little more. And obviously that's why I'm here to hear everybody's ideas. But overall, I did like how black and white he made it. And I think it's up to you to kind of see how that applies to your own life and reflect on that. Yeah, awesome. And see, fear, fear is definitely one of those things that I think in, in the case that we're talking about here in this context, I think we can all understand what that means to act <clears throat> from a place of fear versus faith. However, I think there's, there's a nuanced conversation to have about fear. Um, a while back, I read Gavin De Becker's book, The Gift of Fear, and Jordan Peterson talks about fear. And the, the, the key thing in my mind to understand about fear is that fear is an indicator, right? Fear doesn't have to be accepted for what it is, but it should be paid attention to because it means there's something there that's potentially meaningful and it matters what you do with it. If you act instinctually out of fear, if you just act out of fear the way that Napoleon Hill is talking about or the devil is talking about and fear is sort of that, that guide rail that keeps you from doing the things that you want, obviously that's going to slow your progress a lot. But if you totally turn the, the tables on that <clears throat> and just say, you know what? Fear doesn't have any place in my life. I'm totally going to ignore fear. It doesn't mean anything. I think that's, that's a potentially bad place to be, but I, you know, maybe that, that nuance is not necessarily for this discussion. I just, that's what came to mind. 
uh, were there any other major principles or takeaways that you felt like you wanted to uh, just list off from the book? But it's up to you. Um, no, that was a good place, I think, just kind of a general overview. And I think that nuance is important. That's not something I was aware of, really. And it makes sense that fear would have a positive impact in certain areas in your life. So, yeah, but yeah, it, it's worth looking into. Well, maybe we'll turn actually that is, again, one of those principles. We'll have that more nuanced discussion when we get to that principle. All right. Last call, if there was anybody who completed the exercise from last week of gaining an overview type picture of the book and would like to give their takeaways, now's your chance. You've got four seconds to put it in the chat. Cool, we're moving on to this week's principle. All right, principle number one, everybody. Here it is. Do your own thinking on all occasions. The fact that human beings are given complete control over nothing, save the power to think their own thoughts, is laden with significance. Now, Alex and I had a little discussion about this, about how we were going to talk about this topic. And one of the things that stood out to me in this particular framing here, there's sort of a, a what and a why and a how to all of this. So the first part is the what. The fact that human beings are given complete control over nothing, save the power to think their own thoughts. That's the what, right? You have the power to think your own thoughts. That's the only thing you have complete control over. <clears throat> Everything else is, is outside of your complete control. Now, technically, I'm, I'm not a, a free will dualist. I, I do think that what we talk about as choices still follow a cause, uh, a chain of cause and effect. But I think that heuristic of talking about choice in this way is actually super useful. I just want to get that out of the way. I pulled a quote from the book that I think is useful to talk about the, the what, and then we'll move into the, the why and the how. So here's the quote. It's on page 133 of my copy. The, the um, question is, there's no such thing as luck, is there? And the devil answers emphatically, no. Circumstances which people do not understand are classified under the heading of luck. Back of every reality is a cause. Often the cause is far removed from the effect, uh, is far removed from the effect that the circumstance can be explained only by attributing it to the operation of luck. Nature knows no such law as luck. It is a man-made hypothesis with which he explains away things he does not understand. The terms, quote, luck and, quote, miracle are twin sisters. Neither of them has any real existence except in the imaginations of people. Both are used to explain that which people do not understand. And I think part of what this is highlighting is essentially the dichotomy of control in, in a uh, zoomed out sort of way. So for anybody who's not familiar with Stoicism, uh, I do just want to bring in this concept and then we can move into the why and the how. For the Stoics, there are things which are not under your control and things which are. For you to think your own thoughts in the way that this is um, imploring you to do, it's one way of clarifying the things that are under your control and making your actions more deliberate. You know, you're switching from system one to system two, and, and that's the thinking fast and slow um, <clears throat> analogy. System one is essentially the, the drifting, uh, the mechanism of the drifting self. And system two is the deliberate, uh, the deliberate mode of cognition. A uh, couple of other quotes in terms of the why here. Um, you know, the, the end of this quote does say, the power to think their own thoughts is laden with significance. On page 134, uh, they say that all deeds follow thoughts. Uh, so explaining that, oh, they're explaining that, that thoughts are more important than deeds only because deeds follow your thoughts. Thinking your own thoughts allows you to do your own deeds. Your actions will follow your character and those actions will follow your character regardless of your, whether or not your character is made up of your own thoughts. 
So then the most important question is the how. In my mind, you know, we can, we can get lost in the discussion of, of these principles and their merit, but at the end of the day, we're here to implement some practical philosophy. So one more quote, and then I want to hand off to Alex for this. On page 125, he says, what would happen if a real thinker did appear? And the devil answers, people would learn the greatest of all truths, that the time they spend in fearing something would, if reversed, give them all they want in the material world and save them from me after death. Isn't that worth thinking about? Then he asks, <clears throat> why are these true scientists, these true real thinkers out of your reach? And the devil answers, because they think for themselves and spend their time studying natural laws. They deal with cause and effect. They deal with facts wherever they find them. So Alex, you had brought up in our discussion a point about paradoxes. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you want to go ahead and relate that? Yeah, and, and for this, I want to focus specifically on that first part of the quote. People would learn the greatest of all truths that the time they spend in fearing something would, if reversed, give them all that they wanted in the material world and save them from me after death. So it, it seems to me like when we're talking about the how here, how do you just switch from spending your time fearing something to reversing that and getting everything you want out of the world? And I think it's one of those instances where it's basically a paradox um, and I think a lot of deeper psychological truths appear as these. And I want to use two examples to try to pr explain my point. Think about the, the Buddhist path to enlightenment, or just in general in Buddhism, thinking about suffering, or life as suffering. And there's, once you accept that life is suffering in a way, it relieves you, it helps, it changes your mindset in a way where it no, the suffering no longer feels the same. It never, no longer feels as painful or as what I would describe as suffering. It's a switch that you have to accept to get to the other side of it. Um, and it's something I don't know, it, it's something that needs to be experienced for yourself. It's an, an experiential shift for your brain. And I don't know of any way to, through text or through anything else, have it make sense. Um, and that's why I, th I think one reason why this book sometimes gets polarized reactions, because I think if you've experienced this, some of these things resonate very strongly and the how just inherently makes sense because you've ex had an experience like that. Um, another example of a, a counterintuitive uh, thought is pretending to be brave, right? And I think that could apply to this fear thing. Um, pretending to be brave is actually just being brave. It's, it's no different. And I got that from somewhere. I, I wish I could credit it to, but if anybody knows where that's uh, from, feel free to put that in the chat. But it's, I, I think that applies to this, where it just needs to be this kind of, uh, have an, you need to have some type of insightful moment that shows you this. Does that make sense, Chase? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I think as far as I understand, what you're getting at is that there's a, there's a broader psychological insight here that shows up as a, a paradox. Uh, the first part, uh, can you, can you sort of explain the, the paradox in outwitting the devil? Like what's the, the first part and what's the second part that, that contradicts it as far as you're, you're seeing. So the first part is that people are spending all their time in fear and that it seems to be unavoidable. Okay. Right. And mm -hmm. it's, it's about the flipping of it. If it's reversed. So if it's, I don't see it as actually like, you see what I mean? It's. 
I think I see what you're saying. So essentially that the fear is a reaction. So fear is typically a reaction to something that you're perceiving as, as negative or potentially harmful. Right. And the, the message of fear is that if you reverse your reaction, something bad will happen. Yep. Right. If you are afraid of the snake, the action that that implies is run away from the snake. Because if you do the opposite, if you reverse your fear, the snake will bite you, you will die. Now, if you're living your life that way, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a paradox because the message that your brain is giving you for how to act in face of this fear is that same message of, well, if you don't act this way, you're going to die. But the reality of the situation, the deeper truth of the situation is that if you reverse what you're doing, you'll actually live. Like what you're doing now is dying. What you're doing now is stagnating and moving backward. But if you reverse that, you'll actually live. And so fear is essentially a poor indicator for the current situation, you know, the current social context, the current context of trying to be success successful, fulfilled, enlightened, mm -hmm. um, you know, transcendent in a way, uh, yeah. Is that, yeah. No, that explain that properly. That that's yeah, what I understand. I'd say that's saying. exactly right. And, and, um, like, as you mentioned before, it, it could be a good indicator for this is a meaningful experience. I should not, um, I, I should use thinking as this whole section is based around to decide actively what to do with this situation. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's counterintuitive. I mean, that's, that's what we're working on. That's what non-drifting is. You know, we're shifting into system two, which is not driven by emotion, like fear, things like that. And we're, we're moving up to deliberate action. Yeah. So Joe made a point and uh, there was another point that came up when you and I were discussing what to talk about in this topic that, both tie in to a thinker that I've been uh, somewhat obsessed with lately, uh, Scott Barry Kaufman, who, who's a student of Abraham Maslow. And uh, the thing that, that Joe brought up about independence versus helping others, we'll, we'll get into that for sure in, one, in the other principle about essentially giving first before you expect to receive. Uh, but the, the principle there that comes from Maslow and eventually Kaufman, uh, is that in order to be a transcendent self, in order to fulfill your, and we'll talk about this in a second, your set of B needs, being needs, part of your process has to move from a purely internal to a, an integrated internal and external perspective where, where you are helping others, you're integrating the, the social context that you're in within your your actions and your your being throughout the world and you had brought up uh this idea that we had called the broad negative implication of social interconnectedness you want to do you want to talk about that and and tie that in yeah um so when we were talking about this i was thinking about the this kind of core emotion of fear and and the social implications of it and how, you know, social anxiety or social fear is such a big part of our, our species. And what does that mean? And I was thinking about, can everybody be non drifters? W would our society be able to exist currently or have been able to develop ever? Um, and I think that social Fear is part of what led us to be able to create societies and cultures. Um, it put a limiter on the ability of the individual potential to thrive, possibly at the benefit of the group. Um, social pressure and shame and the fear of these negative social interactions, interactions and judgment held society together, um, united with fewer defectors because people were afraid of the negative social Im implications. Um, so are these two things inextric inextricably sorry, <laughs> connected? Um, 
and like I mentioned last time, if everybody, or, or like I just mentioned, if everybody was a drift, was a non-drifter and going their own separate ways, kind of like what Joe mentioned with creativity, like if everybody's just going out and doing their creative goals and fulfilling this, would this continue to be true, this whole book, or would it all fall apart and society would just crumble? Um, right. Yeah, that's kind of what my thoughts were. Yeah, and I don't know in reality if there is an answer. I think the place that my mind goes with that, I'm, I'm trying to do the thought experiment of what would it look like for everyone to be a non-drifter in a sense. And uh, one, of the th- one of the things that, w- that we had mentioned that I could imagine it in a society where robots and AI take care of all the basic needs and everything right. and just allow a, a basic platform for everybody to creatively live life as they choose. But. Yeah, and and I think that I think that that's still going down the lane of of where I was going with that. I think that still has to do with what does it actually take for a person to make the switch from being a drifter to a non-drifter? Like, what's the catalyst that causes somebody to have that first moment where they're like, you know what? Let me kick in my system two and stop and you know, break this sort of chain of habitual reactivity, this chain, <clears throat> the the hypnotic rhythm that the devil talks about in the book. And I think for me to have some understanding of that, I reference, and this is going again to Scott Perry Kaufman, which is where I heard of it, where I heard of this idea first, but I think this goes back to Maslow the idea of deficiency needs versus being needs. And and maybe we should just depart for a second to explain what that is. And then we'll, we'll bring it back to how this ties into thinking your own thoughts. Uh, Cause I think this is an important part of analyzing where, where your own thoughts come from because your thoughts are tied to your needs anyway. So just for the sake of terms, let's get everybody on the same page. Deficiency needs versus being needs or D needs and B needs. Deficiency needs are the kinds of needs that you have where when you lack them, you feel craving that supersedes or has the potential to supersede your values. And that, that, uh, that prioritization can really only be reordered through some pretty strong discipline, pretty strong system two work. So for example, hunger, right? many of us have experienced extreme hunger to the point where we let pieces of our character go. Like we're, we're willing to be mean to people. We're willing to cut in line. We're willing to cheat. We're willing to, you know, be a little extra jerky to get the sandwich or get the coffee or whatever the next thing is where you've got this deficiency need in place And because it's unfulfilled, you just have a strong evolutionary drive to fulfill it at the cost of longer term, potentially valuable things. So those are deficiency needs. And in the uh, explanation of that deficiency needs would be things like hunger, sex, love, uh, shelter, things like that, that are really the foundation of your personal security. And in the sailboat metaphor, those things are also things like self-esteem, connection, safety. And that's a little bit of a deeper way of looking at those deficiency needs. Um, But that's potentially for another discussion. Whereas being needs, be needs, uh, or Maslow called them meta needs, I guess. uh, Those are higher order needs that don't supersede your values. They're integrated with your values. Uh, Things like justice, liveliness, beauty, truth, meaningfulness, autonomy, uh, things like that. Those are, those are being needs. And when we come back to this question of what 
societally sets people up to have that first moment where they kick in their system too, and they're on the path to not drifting. Uh, you know, I would pose the question that are there, are the drifters of society largely people who are forced to constantly address deficiency needs more than others, whether that's actual poverty, whether that's emotional poverty of some sort, like whatever the deficiency needs you want to look at are the drifters in society, the people who are stuck on their deficiency needs. And do you have community level deficiency needs that infect the community such that when people start to become non drifters, they're more faced with that, that resistance, that pressure that the devil even talks about in the book of like, you know, people are going to bring you back down. Uh, that's sort of the, the place my mind goes to that. Do you want to react to that? And then we'll bring it back into the. Yeah, it definitely raises the question of how applicable are these techniques and ideas for everyone? And that's, that's something that I, I feel like with a lot of different philosophies, I have a hard time wrestling with. Um, because kind of like w what I alluded to with talking about the paradoxes is I don't know how much choice people have to have an experience that convinces them of the validity of an argument. Hmm. And also, like, like you mentioned, are they in a position or an environment that allows them to, you know, one, be exposed to ideas that would let them, I don't know, fast track to assist to, to be needs or it, it, for example, is the environment even allow them to conceptualize B needs, right? To even know that there's something beyond these, these D needs. Cause mm -hmm. I, I could imagine a situation where, like you said, you're super hungry and that those kind of fall to the wayside. And that's when we know we're still going to get food in we, you know, and yeah, it's it still not actually not actually in peril. But what if these things are actually uh, constants? Um, oh. I, it, it seems like it poses a potentially um, like uh, obstacle that that I can't think of a way to to get around. Right, and so to tie it back in, the devil actually talks about these things in the book. Uh, he talks about bribing victims through their natural desires and leading them astray. I think that's exactly where this deficiency needs uh, idea connects with outwitting the devil is that if you have deficiency needs that are part of your natural desires, you can be led astray. You, that's how you become a drift. That's the path into drifting is being leveraged through your natural desires. Um, our friend John talks about it as getting through life versus getting from life. I think that's another uh, beautiful way to explain it. These, it's like a Venn diagram of explanations that's popping into my head that are all talking about this same idea. Uh, and in the book, you know, the way that he talks about leveraging those things is through things like flattery and propaganda. And the big, big one that we already touched on is fear. So, how do we how do we use our natural faculties to leverage ourselves the other way yeah i i think that's just thinking right it's using the power of our brains like the the premise of this quote yeah. it's becoming aware of what is actually happening and so that yeah. awareness that lets you know, oh, this person's probably scamming me right. and allows you to react accordingly and not just be totally bamboozled and have no idea what's going on. And, and that can apply to every situation you're in. It gives you the ability to not need to be used or abused and wasting your time with any different thing, whether it's a, whether it's social interactions or time spent on career things or, or just, it gives you, like, I think the devil mentions, it's the only thing 
only tool that we have at our disposal to act as our own um, individuals. Yeah. So then here's the, here's the question that I'll pose to everyone. And I want you to think about this. And when we open up for discussion after the podcast, this can be the first discussion question, but how do we train ourselves to be more deliberate thinkers? How do we train ourselves to think our own thoughts and not be caught up in thoughts that are fed to us? So that's the question. The exercise for the week is one technique for building some awareness, building some mindfulness, but it's just the path in. It's not the full, it's not the full path for becoming a deliberate thinker of your own thoughts. So I'm all over that question. How do we train ourselves to maintain that, that awareness, that thinking? And before we go into discussion, I want to present the exercise for the week. And if you think of something that it would be a good, that would be a good answer to this question that would maybe supplement this exercise, absolutely feel free to throw it in, you know, post it on the, in the comments on the meetup page, send me an email about it, whatever you want to do. And then let's talk about it next week when you implement it this week and see how it worked. So here's the exercise for the week. First of all, before we give out what it is, I like what we did last time. Commit yourself right now, if you'd like, if I've earned your trust, commit yourself to a specific amount of time this week. Not every day, just at one point this week, or it could be every day if you want. And set aside five minutes, 10 minutes to complete this exercise, to really dedicate some time to it and to try to help yourself with it. And if it's the worst thing in the world, you know, come back next week and tell me that it was horrible. But commit yourself to a specific chunk of time and then plan exactly when you're going to do that. So if you're thinking to yourself, okay, you know what, I'll give them 10 minutes. I've got 10 minutes during my lunch break on Thursday. Okay, lunch break on Thursday, I'm going to spend the first 10 minutes doing this exercise that he's about to talk about. Perfect. Plan. So do that real quick. And then here's the exercise. And it's posted in the meetup page. Uh, so you're, you're welcome to get it there. Or if anybody needs me to repost it in the chat, I can do that. Keep a journal or start a journal of your thoughts and beliefs, especially if you have dominating thoughts that are guiding your actions, but really any of your thoughts about the world. And then use these four criteria to evaluate whether the thoughts are your own. And these are just my criteria. This is what I came up with that I like. And I'm going to be doing this exercise a little bit more this week as well. Um, and I'll share with you what I get from it. So criteria number one is valence. Valence just means, are these thoughts good or bad? I like to use the terms preferred or dispreferred. And that's, that's super simple. That's an easy answer. It's just, do I prefer to have this thought or is this thought something I might consider negative or dispreferred? Now, second is value. Does this thought deliver value to me or does it make me amenable to someone else's will? Is this a thought that is helping me operate in the world toward the things that I want or think that I want? Or is this a thought that is not actually serving me, it's sort of extraneous to my goals. Number three is the source. Where did this thought come from? Is the source reliable? This is where the D and B needs come in. If, if your thoughts, especially dominating thoughts, come from a deficiency need, that's a good place to evaluate, to reevaluate your actions concerning those needs and starting with your thoughts around those needs. And then lastly, give yourself a counterfactual. Now, counterfactual thinking is this amazing tool that unfortunately people are so bad at. So I feel like I have to explain this. This is the last criteria is just give yourself the, the counterfactual and like ask it as a question. 
<clears throat> and here's the simplest way of thinking about this. If my thought was not true, how would I know? Would I know? Or would I still believe it? So I came up with a couple examples. These are not my actual thoughts. These are thoughts that I thought up for the sake of examples. So let's go through these two real quick. And I think this will, this will make more sense and I can answer any questions um, if people have questions. So the first thought is, I don't deserve my career. I'm not as good at my job as everyone thinks. I'm sure there are people uh, listening to this who have thought that at one point or another. So number one, valence. Is this preferred or dispreferred? I would consider this a dispreferred thought. Number two is value. Is this thought delivering value to, me, to, to you? I would say no. The thought that you don't deserve your career or that you're not as good at your job as everyone thinks, not delivering you value. It's making you less confident in your work. It's emotionally negative. It's bringing you down. Source. Where did this thought come from? Like, why do you have this thought? Maybe it's, I get this from comparing myself to my peers at work. I only see their achievements and compare that to my own achievements and my mistakes, not even seeing their mistakes. And so that's an unfair comparison. Is that a reliable source? Probably not. <clears throat> and then the counterfactual for that, the counterfactual for that would be this. If I was bad at my job, how would I know? Well, maybe I might get fired or let go for underperforming. How about this? If I wasn't qualified, would I have been hired? Do I trust the hiring team to have hired me for the right reasons? If I was as incompetent as I seem to think, would I really have the achievements that I do? You know, those are some counterfactual examples for the, the thought. So, one more thought, quick example. I'm a good listener and my friends really appreciate that about me. Number one, valence. I would consider that a preferred thought. I would prefer to have friends who uh, appreciate my listening skills. So it's a happy thought, positive. Number two is value. I would say this delivers me value. It gives me confidence in my friendships and my character. Number three, source. Interesting. Where did I get this thought from that I'm a good listener? Well, I've been told by my friends that they appreciate how I listen. I'm able to reflect in detail about things people tell me. I notice myself waiting to give feedback, even when it pops into my head, to make sure that I understand and that it's clear what someone is telling me before I try to offer my advice. So I think that's a fairly reliable source for this thought that I'm a good listener. And then the counterfactual, this one is a little harder. If I was not a good listener, would I still think I was based on what's going on? Like, how would I know? Well, people may not tell me that I'm a good listener, but that, that doesn't mean I wouldn't be. How would I know if I wasn't a good listener? Well, would I hear, would people tell me less than they do? Like, how, how do I know it's true that, it, that I'm a good listener? And I think that that comes back to the source and the reliability of that source. So the counterfactual, maybe I'm overcomplicating it. It's actually pretty simple. Would I know if I wasn't a good listener? Yeah, I think I would. I think that I wouldn't have all this evidence that I'm a good listener. So there's your thought analysis, right? It's these four criteria. It's pretty simple. And I think the hardest part is the counterfactual, but I think that that kind of thinking is extremely important. So that's the exercise for the week. You're welcome to expand or contract that as you will. I hope that you get something out of it. First of all, if there are any questions about the exercise, go ahead and pop a exclamation point or something in the chat right now. You can ask, clarify. Alex, do you have any questions about the exercise? Any thoughts about it? No, I, I think it's a good exercise. I think, do you have any recommendations on where to start? Yeah, that's. I would, I would assume personally, if I was deciding, I would pick whatever I feel like the most relevant or important are 
or for me, I have yeah. a journal. So I'll probably go back through and look at the things that come up consistently. Yeah. You know, the themes and, and try to pay attention to those and pick the ones that I feel like should be investigated. Yeah. Well, so as we mentioned a little bit earlier, actions tend to follow from your thoughts, whether they're your conscious thoughts or not. I would actually start by looking at your actions and look at the ones that stand out to you, good or bad. If they stand out to you as actions, they're probably relevant to your character. And I would, I would look at the thoughts that are behind those actions and start with an, analyzing those. But I would say otherwise, be creative with it. Whichever, whatever thoughts you come up with, put them through this analysis. It only takes a minute to, to go through and evaluate based on those criteria. So cool. Well, we'll leave it there. Thank you for listening to the switch. I hope to see everybody back next week for principle number two, numero dos. And I hope that everybody has a good time with that exercise. I hope you find something meaningful from it. Um, if you do it, please come back next week and volunteer your insight. I, I really value uh, hearing from you guys. Thank you again to Joe uh, and David for uh, speaking up today and for everybody coming and listening. We will now move on to the discussion section moderated by Shri.